Hello again. I've put this video together just to support my other material really on how a two-stroke works. And what I want to show in this video is how the fuel is taken from the fuel tank through the fuel filter, down through the fuel pipes, all the way through the carburetor into the engine and how it's used for combustion and then how it's expelled from the engine as exhaust fumes. And I want to do this from an inside view. As you can see by some of the images I've put there, I'm going inside all of these parts. I'm not showing you from like a side view or a cross section view. And as I've said, I've done it to help support the other material that I've got here on YouTube, my other videos, and also for a little bit of fun really. And I think if we make things a little fun sometimes, then it's easier to learn and it's easier to stay in once, once we've learned. So here's a different view of looking at something than what I've seen so far. Before I begin, I just want to mention that this is a very basic overview of how a two-stroke engine works. And it's the type of two-stroke like on a garden machine, like on a strimmer, as I've shown. So there might be people out there that know far more about two-strokes than I do. But I just want you to know that this is a basic model and it's my understanding of it over the years. Now, I do realise, and I'm sure you'll agree, that these aren't the most professional images in the world. They're just what I've made in Photoshop myself. I haven't got some tech guy working for me and I'm doing this alongside my regular job in my part time. So do forgive me if they're not totally professional, but I'm hoping they'll get me by and help me to get my point across. So let's get going. So let's imagine now that we're inside the fuel tank and in comes the fuel. We can see there down at the bottom right, the fuel filter and the fuel line. So in comes the fuel now. So we'll let it fill to the top. So we've got the tank now full of fuel, but just for a minute, Let's imagine we're a molecule of fuel. So we're part of this fuel rather than just sitting in this tank. So let's look at it from that perspective. If we were a tiny molecule of fuel, things would look quite different. For a start, we'd be able to see other tiny molecules of fuel. So let's imagine we're one of these molecules. And if we were to look closely at this size, we'd notice that we'd got company. And this is tiny oil molecules that are mixed in with the fuel because this is the type of two-stroke engine that has the oil mixed in with the fuel inside the fuel tank. Some don't, some have it injected later on. Of course, this isn't to exact scale and obviously things would look slightly different if you was an actual molecule. But we can see there that the oil molecules are in purple and the red are obviously the fuel. Just so we can see things a little more clearly though, let's remove those oil molecules, but just know that wherever this fuel goes from here on, there is oil mixed with it. Okay, now the journey begins. Suddenly, the engine has started and there's a suction pressure sucking us towards that fuel filter there. So we're getting closer and it's dragging us towards the fuel filter. At this size, we'd notice all the other millions of molecules going in before us and the suction pressure is dragging us in behind them. Now to the normal eye, the fabric of this fuel filter would look tiny, but when you're the size of a fuel molecule, the porous holes, the little gaps between the fabric would undoubtedly look huge and all the other fuel molecules would have no problem passing through. When we're down at this size, the tiniest globules of dirt or crud look like little mountains and they find it difficult to pass and get stuck there on the fuel filter's fabric. Too much of this crud can of course block the fuel filter's fabric, but as it stands, we can flow right by. And all of the porous holes of the fabric would be like a network of gaps to a fuel molecule. It would be like a jungle of openings and turns. Eventually though, we'd reach the center of the filter and be drawn down the fuel pipe towards the carburetor. And as we travel getting closer to the carburetor, we'd notice a turning upwards in the final stages of the fuel pipe as we reach into the carb. And as we get ever closer, one thing that would become apparent now we're inside the carburetor is this structure here, shown in green. Being one of the first structures we come across in the carb, this is a one-way valve flap, which opens and closes. It opens when the fuel's drawn in and closes to prevent the fuel coming back 
the way it's came and it forms part of the fuel pump diaphragm. It's vital this valve flap works correctly. If it wasn't working, then it could cause the engine to bog down. But we're being drawn in there. There's a suction pressure drawing us through. And as we travel under the valve flap, we come out into a compartment. Now the floor of this compartment, as we look at it there, is part of the carb body. And the walls and the roof there is part of the cap that sits on the body. And between the floor and the walls, there is a diaphragm and a gasket. So just to put that into perspective, this is a two-stroke carburetor and this is the fuel pumped side. And the fuel has just traveled up this area here and into the carburetor. And there's the fuel pump diaphragm I was talking about and the gasket is there on the lid. And the fuel has come through a fuel vein there and it's come up there on this valve flap. It's come underneath this valve flap here, out of that hole. And that compartment I was talking about is all about the lid. So when the fuel come under that flap there, it went into this area here. When this is sitting on there, it forms that compartment. So we now know that the valve flap that we've just travelled under is part of the fuel pump diaphragm itself inside this first compartment and the fuel is starting to flood in. And of course it floods this area because of the suction pressure from this hole here. It's drawing the fuel into it and that's where the fuel heads inside the carburetor body. And that hole there into the carburetor. And when we actually get down here, we can see another hole here on the vertical face of this wall. And the fuel floods in and is drawn through this hole. And this has brought us out into the fuel pump area. And this is where the suction pressure for that fuel we've been feeling has come from. This is what's been drawing us into the carburetor. And that's this area here it's come into. If we take that off, it's come from underneath there. So it's gone down that hole and it's come out here and it's filled this area and it's this part of the diaphragm that's the fuel pump of the diaphragm and it's that fuel pump diaphragm that i'm showing here in green fuel pump rises upwards it draws us in out of that fuel hole it draws us in underneath it and now it comes back down it forces us this way the way the red arrow because we can't come back this way because of that valve flap that we came under this one the one we originally came under very first because when we go back that way the opposite way it forces that valve flap down onto its seat so we can't go back that way we can only come out of the valve flap when the diaphragm lifts and draws fuel in that's why we maintain a flow into the carburetor as the arrow suggests there because when the fuel pump diaphragm lifts it sucks in fuel and then when it comes down, creating a flow pressure going back on itself, that particular pressure pushes down on the top of that valve flap and stops any fuel going back that way. So the fuel pump diaphragm is constantly moving up and down. It's like the heart. It's constantly drawing fuel in and it's pushing fuel that way, drawing fuel in pushing fuel that way. But unlike the heart, the fuel pump diaphragm moves up and down thousands of times a minute. It moves at the same speed as the piston travels up and down in the engine. So each time the piston lowers, the fuel pump diaphragm lowers. And each time the piston rises, the fuel pump diaphragm rises. So the fuel pump diaphragm continues to rise and draw all the fuel in underneath it. And it's all been drawn to this end of the fuel pump reservoir. This is the exit end, and as the diaphragm comes down, it creates a pressure forcing the fuel through that hole and down through the carburetor. This is the route the fuel has to take because it can't come back this way, remember, because any pressure coming back this way forces this valve flap back on its seat and it can't go any further. So it continues its journey through this hole. Any hole in this diaphragm or any defect in this diaphragm can stop this diaphragm traveling up and down and it can create problems such as bog down and lack of fuel getting to the engine. In a nutshell, it would lose its pumping efficiency. The fuel pump of the diaphragm. While we're on the subject of this diaphragm pump, let's just take a look at how it gets its energy to rise up and down and create the pumping action in the first place. Let's take a look behind it. And as we slide down, Let's imagine that what we're uncovering 
is actually what's behind it. And what you'll notice by the hole at the top is that there's an arrow, a blue arrow coming down representing air. So air is coming out of that hole there. And the whole roof there with the hole is part of the lid that attaches on that we saw earlier. Sitting on there. And in order for the diaphragm to lower, air pressure up here gathers above the diaphragm and that pushes down on the back of the diaphragm and lowers the diaphragm. And as it does, it forces the fuel out through that hole as we saw earlier. And air leaving this area back through the hole creates a vacuum and sucks the diaphragm back up. And so it's this continual pushing and vacuuming of air that allows it to raise up and raise down, raise up and raise down. Just before we continue with the fuel path through the carburetor and into the engine, let's just take a look where this pressure comes from. This air pressure that comes in and out of this hole. Let's take a look inside. Now we're inside the area of the pulse line. And in the distance there is the bottom of the piston. This isn't the inlet pipe that takes in fuel for combustion. This is the bottom of the piston. And you can see the piston rising up and down there. And what we'll notice is as the piston rises, it draws in air to it. And as it lowers, it pushes air back. And it's a continual cycle of vacuum and push, vacuum, push. And that vacuum and pushing is felt here. And we can see now how the diaphragm moves up and down. And now we know that, let's continue on now on our fuel path journey. We're brought into another compartment now, which is the compartment just underneath the second valve flap, the one-way valve flap. And the compartment's necessary here because it needs to fill underneath it in order to push out from underneath it so that it can act as a one-way valve again. That's through there and it's come up here through that valve flap now. And carried by the pressure from the fuel pump diaphragm, we go under the one-way valve and we come out into another compartment. Part of this lid, the recess there, when that fits on top, it forms the compartment. So it's come under the one-way valve and it's flooding this whole compartment. The fuel can't come back this way, remember, because as soon as it does, the pressure pushes down on that valve flap and shuts off the fuel from going back any further. So it continues to flow one way only. And as the pressure builds up inside this compartment, the fuel heads down this hole here. The flow pushes us down into that fuel hole. And this brings us out into yet another compartment, a lower compartment. Of course, this is the fuel hole we've just come through. And this on the side wall here is another fuel hole. In the meantime, fuel is still flowing in and pressure's building up. Again, once the pressure's built up in this compartment, the fuel is going to start heading into this fuel hole. And that's the way we're being pushed now in through that hole. Now this time we brought out somewhere quite different. This little compartment has within it the strainer filter that strains the fuel before the fuel heads towards the needle valve. Immediately the fuel starts to flood in and it filters through this metal gauze filter here. This is like a single screen of meshing. And its main function is to filter out any impurities, any crud or dirt that's still left in the fuel that somehow got past the fuel filter in the fuel tank. Now these strainer filters are removable. And what you tend to find with these strainer filters is that they can be a, a, a very thin layer, if you like, of like a varnishy crud on them. And that reduces their efficiency for the fuel to pass through. Thankfully though, these don't cost too much and they can be replaced easily. But if they are blocked like this, it can cause the machine to bog down and lack fuel going into the engine. But let's imagine all is well and we're filtering through this metal strainer filter now nicely. And there's the strainer filter we're talking about and the fuel is filtering through. And now we've filtered through that meshing of that gauze, we can now see down a long tunnel. And at the end of that tunnel, we can see an orange structure. And from our point of view here, it's moving back and then forward, back and then forward. And as it moves back, it creates a gap. And as it moves forward, it creates a seal. And of course, the fuel floods down into this tunnel and heads down towards the bottom of that needle valve. And what happens is when the needle valve moves back, 
it allows the fuel through into the next compartment. And when that needle valve comes forward, it settles fast on its seat, preventing any fuel going through. And under precise timing, that's how it's regulating the fuel going into the next compartment, back and forth, back and forth. But let's now imagine that the needle valve is open enough and long enough for us to go right through with the rest of the fuel. And when we get up to the needle valve, this is what we see. This is a cross-sectional view. And I've shown it like this to illustrate my point better. So this is the needle valve itself. And this needle valve moves up and down there inside the outer part. This area is responsible for creating that seal when the needle valve sits fast on its seat. It's usually made out of a type of rubber and it usually comes to a point here. So as we've seen, when the needle valve is sitting fast on its seat in this position and everything's sealed in these areas, it prevents the fuel from going up past it. When the needle valve does rise, it allows the fuel to flow freely through the gap alongside the needle valve itself within that outer channel. And its destination here is the metering area. And as long as the needle valve is in the raised position, fuel can freely flow in. And this is what the needle valve has been regulating. It's been regulating the amount of fuel that reaches this metering area. If we look at the top there, shown in green, that's the metering diaphragm. And all the fuel is flooded underneath that. At this point, if we just take a look at a different view of this, there's the top of the needle valve, and we're looking down on top of it a little more now. This is the metering diaphragm, and this is the little metal dowel part that contacts the back of the metering lever here. So this is the metering lever, and if we could take a look behind it, we'd see that there's a metering spring there holding the back of that lever upwards. And because the metering lever is pivoted here, when the metering spring pushes up on the back of the metering lever, it pushes down on the front here on the needle valve. And that's what creates the seal, stopping the fuel coming back up that way. So in order for the needle valve to rise and come up this way, another process has to occur. Taking a look there, this is the hole to the entrance of the main jet. And it's this colour because it forms part of the main jet that goes through the carburetor body and out into the venturi. So imagining that there isn't yet fuel in the metering area anywhere at all where we can see there, what happens is when the engine started up and there's a direction of airflow going through the venturi into the engine, it creates a vacuum and air that's inside here, inside the metering area, starts to leave the metering area and goes through into the venturi via this main jet. That then has a direct effect on this metering diaphragm here that sits overhead. But just while we're talking about the diaphragm, I'll just explain about it. This diaphragm, as underneath it, just below it where the arrows are, it has a gasket. And it serves two functions. It creates a spacing between the carburetor body and the diaphragm there. And also it helps to seal, make a seal, of course. And for simplicity, I haven't actually shown it there, but that's where it goes. And it usually looks something like this. It has this large hole in the centre there to allow the diaphragm to operate up and down within it, of course. And this is what the diaphragm generally looks like, what I've illustrated in green. So there it is. And just to clarify a little further, that dowly bit there is that bit there on the diaphragm. And that dowly bit there is what acts on the back of the metering lever. So going back to the workings then, as the air is sucked out of this area through the main jet, it affects the diaphragm here and it pulls the diaphragm down like a vacuum. And as it does, it pushes down on the back of the metering lever, pushing the back of the metering lever down. And because it's on a pivot, it lifts the front of the metering lever up and up comes with it the metering needle. That then, of course, picks the metering needle off its seat, breaking that seal and allowing the fuel to flow up through, as we've seen before. And that means we've now got fuel all inside here, inside the metering area. That's why it's so vitally important that everything's in good order here. All these little parts are working well. If there's a puncture in the diaphragm there, it, it won't be able to be sucked down with the 
vacuum pressure so it won't push back on the needle valve. If the needle valve itself is bent or not set correctly or the, there's a problem with the seat on the needle itself where the needle sits onto its seat preventing any fuel coming through. If they aren't all working correctly it's going to have a big effect on the running of the engine itself. So everything needs to be clean and not least the main jet needs to be nice and clean. Even the metering spring behind the metering lever there, if that's not tensioned correctly or it's the incorrect spring for whatever reason, it's not going to push back up on the metering lever and push down on the metering needle creating a seat when it's needed. So that needs to be replaced if it's in bad order. There is another area here. This is the Welsh plug or the core plug and these ideally need to be removed and cleaned underneath there. If you were to remove one, you'd see it would look something like this. And I've removed a few of these in the past and I found crud and dirt behind these. And when I couldn't actually get a carburetor going, I actually have removed these and cleaned out the crud and I could get them going again. I'm not saying it works every time, but it is worth taking them out. But you do have to remember that you'll need a kit with Welsh plugs in to replace this. Now going back to how it works again. We've already mentioned that the air leaving the metering area causes the vacuum and then what follows it then is the fuel. So the fuel then follows through in through that main jet and into the Venturi and that creates the vacuum to keep the metering diaphragm down which of course keeps the metering lever down and keeps the needle open allowing the through road of fuel to keep going through that system. Some of the fuel is drawn into a smaller hole like this which supplies the idling speed of the engine but it's the main jet that supplies most of the fuel to the engine, particularly when the engine is on full revs. And as I've said, as long as this diaphragm is down and it's acting on the back of this metering lever, then there'll be a constant through road of fuel coming out, up from the needle valve and down into the main jet. And this diaphragm and the needle valve are constantly up and down and in intermediate stages. It's not as if they're all the way up all the time and all the way down all the time. There are stages in between just to regulate that fuel going into the main jet. But we're inside here because we are a molecule of fuel. And right now we're being drawn in. That vacuum's drawing us into the main jet. We're now within the main jet itself. And from this angle, it just looks like a long tubular structure. And if we look there at the end, we can see what looks like air rushing past the end of that tube from right to left. This is pure air that's just come through the air filter and it's on its way through the carburetor's venturi and in towards the engine. And as it goes that way, it passes through the bottom of the jet here. Remember, this is pure air because it hasn't yet had the fuel added to it because we are the fuel. So now we head down towards it. As we get closer and closer, we can start to see things more clearly. This is pure air, this side coming from the right. And this is the point at which the fuel is added. So it's now air and fuel mixed. And they're both now heading this way towards the engine together. Now we can see how vital it is that this flow of fuel continues to go through the jet and into the Venturi to mix with that air because any stoppage, any blockage in this jet, it would starve the engine of fuel and therefore the engine would bog down. That's if it would start at all. Now we've seen the fate of the fuel molecules in front of us. Let's head that way now, closer into the Venturi. That pure air rushing past is drawing us down the jet and sucking us into the Venturi. And that's where we now are. We're inside the Venturi mixed with the fuel on our way to the engine. Down there and through out here, the main jet into the Venturi here and all the fuel has gone that way, right through towards the engine. So here we are heading in, but let's just pause here for a moment and look in towards the engine that way. So we're looking out from the Venturi now and we can see the piston moving there in the distance. And in reality, it wouldn't move this slow, of course, and it would reciprocate up and down thousands of times every minute. In reality, though, as we look down towards the engine, there would be this air shut off valve. We call this the throttle butterfly. That's this butterfly here. And it's this butterfly valve that opens and closes in accordance with how the operator uses the throttle to regulate the amount of fuel going into the engine. 
So of course in this position it means the operator has pulled back 100% on the throttle, giving it full revs. And of course when it's in this position the operator's let go of that throttle completely, blocking the air and fuel getting into the engine and so the engine revs will have come right down to a minimum or even stopped. During operation then, this is continually opening and closing by the operator to get that right amount of fuel into the engine as and when the operator needs it. It's important to remember though that it isn't that it's either completely closed or completely open all of the time. There are intermediate stages, obviously the operator might only want half throttle, three quarter throttle, and that will depend on whether this butterfly is three quarters open or half open, etc. OK, so we now know that the throttle butterfly is here and we know what it does and we know that it sits between the main jet and the engine and that it sits on the outer edge of the carburetor's venturi. So it's still sitting inside the venturi. This is all the venturi here. And if we move in slightly, this is an inlet gasket which sits between the carburetor and the inlet manifold there. And it sits in the junction between the two to provide an airtight seal to stop any of the air and fuel escaping and to stop any inlet of air coming from the environment at that point. So now we know what that does and we know this is the inlet manifold. This is usually made of like a rubber material or some kind of flexible fibre. So it's vital that all is in good order with the inlet manifold and the gaskets there so that we don't lose any pressure or gain any air where we shouldn't because that will create the engine to bog down. Now this area here usually forms part of the piston cylinder or pot. And again with an airtight seal it's connected here to the inlet manifold. And that means we've got an airtight seal all the way down here right to the piston. As I've already mentioned the piston's moving up and down at the end here thousands of times per minute so we're not actually to true scale of course but when the piston starts to rise it creates a gap beneath it that air wants to rush in and fill and that creates a vacuum in this tube. The more that piston rises the more vacuum is created beneath it and now it's drawing in the air and fuel mixture that's just come out of the main jet and it continues to be sucked in under the piston. Remember we're one of these fuel molecules and in we go drawn in under the piston. So of course now we're floating around underneath the piston in the crankcase but if we were to look up this is the bottom of the piston there you can see right at the top and the con rod that's connected to the bottom of the piston. This of course is officially called the connecting rod. Looking a little over to the left here we can see this hole where the fuel and air is coming out and that's the hole we've just come out from. Looking over to the right here there's another hole. This is the transfer port. So the piston is right top dead centre in the cylinder there but when it starts to come back down again it starts to push all of that air and fuel together aggregating it, almost compressing it. And as the piston comes down the cylinder even further, it starts to block off that inlet port there that we came out of. So the piston working its way down the cylinder is creating all that pressure there all around of that air and fuel mixture. So the piston's travelled down even further now and we've totally blocked off that inlet port. And it's aggregated that air and fuel even closer together, even more tightly packed. And because it's all tightly packed it needs to go somewhere it's compressed and it can only go one way and that's here through the transfer port this of course is the only port left open having covered the inlet port and whilst this air and fuel mixture has been inside here below the piston it served another function it's lubricated all the bearings in the crankshaft and the main bearings and it's lubricated the cylinder walls as the piston has reciprocated up and down. This lubrication ability is all down to the fact that there's oil mixed in with the fuel of course with it being two stroke. So continuing on further that piston's now come down even further and it's squeezing all of that air and fuel mixture out into the transfer port. Now I know I've suggested that all the air and fuel is leaving through the transfer port out of the crankcase but it's more likely that there'll be some air and fuel left in the crankcase. But for now, as we are a fuel molecule, we're going to head inside that transfer port. So as the piston forces us through, we come out into an upward turning tunnel. And at the end of that tunnel, we can start to see another opening. And if we look closely, we can see the top of the piston here. 
And of course, the role of the transfer port is now apparent. It's to transfer all the air and fuel mixture out of the crankcase at the bottom of the piston all the way up to the top of the piston. And powering the air and fuel up here has come in two main ways. The first, of course, as we've said, is the compressing action of the bottom of the piston forcing us through into the transfer port. And the second is the top of the piston creating a vacuum, sucking us in as it travels down that bit further. And we can see the air and fuel in front of us being drawn in. And the only place for us to go is to follow in behind it. We now find ourselves at the top of the piston and we can see the top of the piston there. And if we look closely here through the blizzard of that air and fuel mixture, we can see what appears to be another opening. This is the exhaust port, the other side of the cylinder. At the same time, we can just make out there a different looking substance leaving that port. Of course, this is the exhaust gases from the last combustion. It's been forced out by us. As we were drawn into the top of the piston, we forced out all of that exhaust gas through the exhaust port. And now as the piston starts to rise, it blocks off that exhaust port. Let's just take away a few of these air and fuel molecules so we can see a little clearer. And if we were to look up at this point, we'd be able to see right to the top of the cylinder or to the pot, as it's otherwise called. And right at the very top of the pot there, we can see something else. This is the bottom of the spark plug that's threaded through. It protrudes out slightly into the pot. And now as the piston rises, we're getting closer and closer to the spark plug. And we also notice that we're compressing together. All of this air and fuel is compressing and getting tightly packed together. Then as the piston gets right to the top and the air and fuel is compressed to its maximum, the spark plug fires. This instantly ignites that special mix of air and fuel and it creates a small explosion like a bomb. This now forces the piston back down, leaving behind a trail of fumes caused by the burning up of the air and fuel by that explosion. As the piston lowers further now, we can see the process of the next phase of combustion to be. As the piston travels down more, we can see from the right there the air and fuel being drawn in on top of it as we were just before we were combusted. And it can be seen now pushing out the exhaust fumes through the exhaust port as we did earlier. The difference with us now though is that we are no longer fuel. We've now changed chemical composition and we've become exhaust fumes. So in that case of course, off we go through the exhaust port. And soon after we've passed through, we find ourselves deep inside the engine's exhaust. Now travelling through here, we see a metal gauze filter. And because we are now tiny exhaust fumes, mainly carbon, we can travel right through the meshing. Now, not all exhausts have these gauze filters and they can be replaced. They generally to capture large particles of carbon. And indeed, if they get too clogged up, they can cause the engine not to be able to rev up efficiently because of backing up of exhaust fumes back into the engine. They also act as baffles, keeping a certain back pressure within that exhaust to allow the engine to run efficiently. But off we go through. And when we get through to the other side, we can see we're in the later stages now of the exhaust. And if we look closely up at the top there, we can see daylight coming through. And that's where we're headed, straight through and out into the environment. And that now indeed completes our journey from fuel tank to exhaust. And something to realise is that it does all this from the fuel tank, right through the fuel lines, through the carburetor, through the whole system, into the engine and out the exhaust, it does that within minutes. And we've took half an hour to go through that. And just before I go, we'll flash through this all again very, very quickly.
I really hope you found this educational and beneficial and a bit of fun because that's what it was designed to do. Thank you so much.